This is called matot or matos, whether you're Ashkenazi or you say it Sephardic, matos would be the uh, Ashkenazi way of pronouncing it. Numbers, the 30th chapter, Parsha Matos, starts off by saying this. Moshe spoke to the heads of the tribes of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing that Hashem has commanded. If a man will take a vow to Hashem or swear an oath to establish a prohibition upon himself, he shall not desecrate his word according to whatever comes out of his mouth, he shall do. But if a woman will take a vow to Hashem or establish a prohibition in her father's home, in her youth, and her father heard her vow or a, her prohibition that she established upon herself, and her father was silent about her, then all her vows shall stand, and any prohibition that she established upon herself shall stand. But if her father restrained, restrained her on the day of his hearing all her vows or prohibitions that she established upon herself shall not stand, and Hashem will forgive her, for her father had restrained her. If she shall be married to a man, and her vow, uh, where uh, her vows were upon her, or an utterance of her lips by which she had prohibited something upon herself, and her husband heard, on the day of his hearing, he was silent about her. Then her vow shall stand, and her prohibitions she, uh, that she established upon herself shall stand. But if on the day of her husband's hearing he shall restrain her, he shall revoke the vow that is upon her, or the utterance upon her lips by which she has prohibited something for, upon herself, then Hashem will forgive. A vow of a widow or a divorcee, Anything she has prohibited upon herself shall remain upon her. This continues on, and we'll actually continue on with more of the text about the vow. But what we're going to discover about the significance of a vow, and why is it here in this text at this time, did not the people of God know what a vow was? Of course they knew what a vow was all about. This is really... This is not about making a promise, okay? This is not about saying, I promise to do this or that, or, you know, I, you know, I want to I wanna quit eating, I don't know, French yes. fries, <laughs> right? If you just say you want to quit doing them, you quit doing them. But if you make a vow to God to do something that is superfluous, that is, that is, that is not something the Torah commanded you to do, uh, you must highly consider this. Why? Because you are bound to that vow. You're bound to do that. The only way to get a vow revoked would be, number one, to be a young girl in her father's home, and you make that vow, and your father can annul that vow if he hears what the vow is. Or if you're married, your husband can hear the vow and go, that, that won't work. Here's an example. You vow never to eat chocolate candy again. And your husband knows how much you love your chocolate candy or whatever. He can say, no, that vow is not going to stand. And it won't stand. And Hashem will forgive you. But the whole point of the vow is your word has, is your words are important. What you say is very, very important. And we know the whole issue of the power of the word and positive speaking and what you say with your lips the uh, you, you, power of life and death is in the tongue. We understand all of those amazing deals. But there's a few things that we should understand about a vow that can help us know whether it is appropriate to ever say that. Now, many of us have made, quote-unquote, declarations or vows before, right? I think a lot of New Year's resolutions are like vows to people. But the whole point is, these are not vows that you make before Hashem. You understand the difference? This is not saying, I'm swearing off biscuits and gravy for the next six months. This is something serious that is far above what you're called to do. Uh, the one thing that you cannot do is make a vow on something that is already 
a Torah prohibition or Torah mitzvah. All right? So you can't say, I'm going to give tzedakah for the rest of my life. That's ridiculous. You, you're supposed to do that anyway. It's not, no, nothing special, right? Yeah. You know, I, uh, you know, I prom- you know, I'm going to make a vow to Hashem that I'm going to guard my tongue. But that's not a, a legitimate vow. So what we find out in the issue of making a vow that becomes really important is the only way that a vow can be made and then rescinded, if a man makes a vow, it's on him. Okay? But only way that he can make that vow and it be rescinded, he has to go to, um, well, in modern days, it would be to a great, a great you know, sage, a great mm-hmm. rabbi who knew Torah law in and out, and he would go through the particulars of your vow and find out if any part of that vow uh, could be nullified by the Torah. It's not like he can go to you and go, oh, you want it nullified, give me $20 and it's nullified. This is not the Roman Catholic Church, okay? You, don't do, you can't absolve yourself from those kinds of sins. So the whole point is, what, what do you do? You go to him, he searches Torah law. So, for example, you say, uh, you know, I've made a vow toward Hashem. I have, uh, I have a you know, difficult time with my desire, and uh, I really like to eat a lot and I want to beg off all fatty foods. Well, right off the bat, you know what he's going to tell you. What? Doesn't count. Right? right? It doesn't count because y- you already are required to eat kosher. And, you know, he could nullify that. At the same time, you could go to him and make a vow that he cannot nullify, and you have to see it through. If you don't see it through, then it becomes a sin to you. Why is that important? Hashem wants you to do what He asked you to do. He didn't ask you to add your own Torah on top of it. The whole part of this is sure. One would ask, well, Rod, what is the difference between one who vows a vow and one who uh, is uh, chassidut, um, one who goes the extra mile, who lives at such a high level of, of restraint and where... Torah says that, you know, you you get up and you pray, uh, you do your obligation of prayers twice, three times a day, but this person says for, you know, the rest of my life, I'm going to do two hours of personal prayer. Very important to them. They can do that. The difference is, is he's not made a vow to Hashem, but at the same time, even if he did, I'm not sure that it's, it's be expected of you in some ways to be a, a, a righteous person to pray. But at the same time, a person that is a um, chesed, and when we say a, a chesed, we're not just talking about men with fur hats and piots mm-hmm. that walk around uh, Brooklyn and, and Jerusalem. Israel. Right, Israel. <laughs> what is a chesed? One, according to Torah, is one who says, this is what your requirements are. Here's the parameter of your requirements. I'm aware of the parameter of my requirements. I do these things. But up on top of that, I will add other levels of observance that I realize are not required of me, but this is the lifestyle that I feel that I'm called to do. That is not a vow. Do you understand the difference? Mm-hmm. In many ways, a B'nai Noach does similar things. Uh, almost like uh, B'nai Noach, at some point of their fervor and their love for Hashem, draws down um, chesedut, you know, the uh, extra requirements upon themselves or stringent things upon themselves that are not required of them, and they're fully aware they're not required of them. But they feel like, you know what, I want to I do this. I want to pray three times a day. I want to, you know, go through the whole process of adding on these d- different things. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not a vow. The whole issue, issue is when we vow something to God that puts a permanent restriction upon you and obligates you, then it becomes a sin if you don't. Why is that important? Because Hashem, Hashem says, it's already going to be difficult for you in your life if you don't follow what I've given you and it becomes a sin. Why add things to your life that otherwise is not a sin? Why add those things? So therefore, a vow should 
really be something that is not spoken. You shouldn't speak a vow to Hashem uh, unless you know for sure that it's the proper thing. And I would say that if you're going to make a vow, you need to do a consultation first before you make that vow. And that would be very important. So you know, you cannot say a vow that, all, like for example, if you've been a Noach, you're going to say, I make a vow that I'm going to follow the, the seven uh, Sheva Mitzvot, the seven Noahide laws. You go, it's not, it's not a vow. You're expected to do that, right? So the whole point is, is be careful what you say, be careful what you do. Why is that important? Right after the incident with Pinchas, <coughs> there was, there was, there was a, it was shocked the camp what took place. So many died because someone else decided to justify their adulterous or sexual promiscuity. They justified it with, uh, with their humanistic logic. In a way, they made their own Torah by saying, Moshe, Moshe married a, a, a Midianite. What, what's the problem here? A Moabite, I mean. Moshe married a Moabite. What, what's the problem? I don't see what the issue is. They made their own Torah. But that was bordering on character assassination. Well, absolutely. But the whole point is, is we know a lot of people that make their own Torah. I mean, most world religions make their own Torah, right? I mean, we all know that. They make restrictions on you that is not found anywhere in the Tanakh. Nowhere in the Tanakh, right? And some of you guys have been born and raised and gone to different types of religious denominations. You remember the restrictions they put upon you. No alcohol if you're Muslim or Southern Baptist. Uh, uh, you know where Baptists don't, uh, don't recognize each other, right? Bar. Bar? Liquor store. Anyway. <laughs> it's Probably all, it, it'll work sometimes. Anyway. Um, the whole point is, is that uh, there, why put those restrictions on yourself if it's not required? It's so much easier. Look, when Hashem said, my law is not too difficult for you. That's doable. It's not something that you should go to the heavens and ask for a great download to help you do it. No, you shouldn't have to travel to the far ends of the sea to find some great sage to teach you how to do it. It's on your lips. The power of what you do is on your lips. It's about making a commitment to Hashem to do what He asked you to do and don't attempt to create your own Torah and invent something more to do. Does that make sense? Good. So let's go. Where were we at? Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, is there any more reward in the Lam Haba for making a vow and fulfilling it? It could be for heaven's sake or it could be for your man's sake. I read on that. Yeah, it, 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 it really depends. depends. on whose sake it's for. Right. Here, okay. Here's the example. Moses if you, gets extra rewards. Right. In the same way, uh, uh, Chesed will put more restrictions upon himself than he needs. There are great rewards, but at the same time, some of those rewards will purely, purely be on this earth, and some will be in the world to come. Uh, here's some practical. I'm trying to think of a practical example of a difference between a a extra extra vows or extra things that you put on yourself that are a benefit to the earth. For example. Uh, the extra vow to do tzedakah would be both because now I'm giving more money than is required and it benefits a lot more people and a lot more light spreads, a lot of more individuals begin to be infected, uh, affected by it. And at the same time in the heavens, I'm depositing great treasure on my own, great reward. But so that that's can't a, be a vow. No, no, it can't be a vow. Absolutely, it can't be a vow. Uh, you just do it. You just do the extra, go the extra mile. So, at the same time, you can have a vow that is not specific in the Torah for you. But you make that higher restriction to you. There's no prohibition to do that, okay? We're not saying it's wrong to make a vow, but we're saying, why make a vow that you're going to break and it become a sin? Because you have failed to do the vow. So the whole point is, why make more sins yeah. for yourself when you can work your way around it and do it? Don't just do it anyway. Vow. Do it without making a vow. Yes, ma'am. Maybe an exception is, uh, you know, the story of Kana when mm -hmm. she prayed for a son. Mm -hmm. Right. And she made a vow 
that if Hashem gave her a son, she would give him to him. Correct. Except, and and that's that's what happened. She fulfilled her vow. Right. And look what her son did. Absolutely. Yes. Let's look so. at uh, another example, which is not a good one. Uh, the story of the ruler, the commander that decides to pray and ask Hashem to deliver him in battle. Mm. And he says, if you will give us this battle, the first person that walks through my door, oh, I will yeah. kill them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there's a debate on whether he actually killed his daughter or she chose to be imprisoned or, you know, be sequestered away from the family because she said she didn't want to have anything to do with, with his sin if she wasn't dealt with. So there is some debate whether she was killed or whether she was sequestered away from the family and she was never with them. Who knows? But at the same time, that is a pretty hefty deal to deal with, right? Now, there are a couple other cases where those vows were made and battle was won, and they fulfilled their vow. But you don't... I mean, listen, we, those people go to combat, we've always heard about, there's no such thing as a foxhole atheist, right? How many people have you heard been in a very dangerous situation yeah. and they promised God the world. The greatest one that I remember comes from a movie called yeah. The End. Is that what it is? I, Dom DeLuise and Burt Reynolds. Yeah. Burt Reynolds is wanting to commit suicide and the whole movie is Dom DeLuise is trying to help him and in his inept comedic style, it is a very funny movie. But in the very end, Dom DeLuise decides he's going to swim out into the ocean and commit suicide. So he gets way out there and he realizes now he's drowning. And he doesn't want to drown. So he's swimming back, and it's horrible. And he's like coughing water and drinking salt water. He's like, oh, God, if you'll help me, I'll do anything you want me to do. Just save my life. I'll do anything. I'll give you all of my money. I'll, whatever I have, I'll give it to you. And he's getting close to the beach. And the closer he gets, it goes from uh, I'll give you everything to 80% to 70%. And then when he got to shore, he says, I'll try to remember to go to church. Right? Right? That's how we are. That's how we are as human beings. So it's, this is Hashem's loving kindness to say, why, why create an environment where you're going to commit a sin? Just do what you're supposed to do. Be a person of your word. Do what you're going to do. Don't, you know, listen, we're, we're in a world right now that is so consumed with, uh, with useless words, right? We love useless words. Advertisements that, that says this makeup will make you ageless. You and I both know it's a lie. Right? You still, if you have wrinkles when you get it, it'll just be wrinkles with stuff in it. <laughs> right? And we all know that. And we still buy the products because we think, I just want to be ageless. Right? And guys will color their beards because it makes them younger. But you know, it's, you're not, your back still hurts when you get out of bed. Right? So it doesn't make you younger. But we like useless words because it feeds our yetzar harar. It feeds our, our desirable inclination. And so if we're not careful, we can become just like our society. We just make promises to God that we never intend on keeping. And we're compiling, compiling sin in our life because it's as if you're taking and creating a Torah prohibition and putting it upon yourself. So we understand that. Did we clear that up? Okay, let's go to um, someone read for me. Um, 11. Verse 11, read loud. But if she vowed in her husband's home, or she established a prohibition upon herself through an oath, and her husband heard about it and was silent about her, he did not restrain her, then all her vows shall stand, and any prohibition she established upon herself shall stand. But if her husband shall revoke them on the day of his hearing, anything that came out of her mouth regarding her oaths or the prohibition upon herself shall not stand. Her husband had revoked them, and Hashem will forgive her. Any vow and any oath prohibition to cause personal affliction, her husband may let it stand, and her husband may revoke it. If her husband shall be silent about her from day to day, he will have let stand all her vows, or all the prohibitions that are upon her, he will have let them stand, for he was silent about her on the day of his hearing. But if she, he shall revoke them after his having heard, 
He shall bear her iniquity. Okay, let's stop. So basically, there is a there's a hierarchy that begins at the beginning. First, Moshe is told to uh, gather. Uh, w one translation says the governors or the rulers or the the chieftains to tell them these things, and it was to be passed down to the children of Israel. And as it filters down, then it becomes not only each tribal member's responsibility, becomes each family head's responsibility, becomes the husband's responsibility to his wife and children. And if he hears her make this vow and he doesn't say anything, he just keeps silent. Like, eh, whatever. But later on, we see negative results come about from it, and then he tries to revoke it, then he is the one that is responsible, and he is the one that has to go present offerings for unintentional sin. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. So, big responsibility. And that's why I have to say, um, and in no way am, am I trying to be comedic, because this is not very funny in a very, what do you call it, sex, sen sex uh, uh, sensitive world. When I'm talking about sex, I'm not talking about the act, I'm talking about male and female. The idea that your husband, even, even a husband that may not be as observant, uh, listen to him. It's important. Okay? Now, sometimes we, you know, say things that you guys think that we're crazy. But it's important to test and make sure that what you're doing is balanced. At the same time, I would say husbands. Now, we all know to listen to our wives, so I don't even have to say that. Oh. No, we do. Well, your husband, <laughs> but your husband isn't part of the community, so we know that he's he's not going to get it. Our husbands listen to their wives, right, men? Oh yeah. Right. But, no. Can no. I yes. A woman would do a vow, and this is why I was reading Greenbaum and a couple other rabbis. Mm -hmm. A woman will make a vow with her heart. Right. A man makes it with his mind. Right. So that he can tell why the woman shouldn't do what her heart wants to do. Right. Like you want to starve yourself, and she is. She has to have babies. Right. You know what I mean? So she can't do without vitamin C or she can't do that for the reproduction of the world. Right. So that's what I think is good. No, absolutely. We have to listen to what a man says because they always think, mm. but they're not sensitive about the thinking. So. Yeah, and know, I think that the reason. That balances everything out. Yeah, one, right. yeah one, of the, one of the things that we could do is sort of a Musar moment, you know, so an ethical moment of how we live our spiritual lives is. That's one of the major reasons of the conflict between a man and a woman in a marriage is sometimes he's going through a logical process and our spouses, the females, are going through an emotional process and they don't always mix. And what appears to the man is that the woman is being irrational. Or emotional. It's right. not about the nail. Huh? It's not about the nail. If you haven't seen the video on YouTube, it's not about the nail. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me. And I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head. And it's relentless. And I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. You do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just. Sometimes it's like there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just... Don't! Try to see things my way Do I have to keep on talking till I can go on? We can work it out We can work it out 
Uh, so the man looks at the woman and says, you're being irrational or emotional. And the woman thinks the man is, <coughs> is not understanding what she's trying to say. You just don't understand me. You're not listening to what I'm saying. And he goes, no, I'm listening. It just doesn't make sense. Why doesn't it make sense? Because it's not following a logical process. We're not saying that women are not logical. Correct. Okay, women are very logical beings. You, <coughs> you guys do amazing things in science and industry and medicine, etc. But the point is, it's not working in our noodles. Okay, men's logic does not work like women's logic. Women's logic is often uh, works through emotional measures, right? You process things emotionally, intuitive, and you make these decisions based on that. And men sometimes will make a bad decision because they didn't put the heart in the matter. Or the intuition. The intuition into it. So that's why we're put together. Hashem puts a husband and wife together. We're supposed to be the perfect blend. We're like the, the major fighting force in the world. When you put two together in Hashem, now mind you, if both are not in Hashem and Hashem is not in that marriage, whatever, I can't, you're, you're, it, you'll be lucky that it'll make it, right? But when you have both in Hashem, you'll get through it. You'll work through it. I, and I tell you, it took me a long time, and I wish my wife was here because I'd be scoring points, but it took me a long time. It took me a long time. Thank you, I appreciate that. It helped me, especially right now. No, but it took me a long time to recognize that, that my wife wasn't mental, that she was actually very intuitive, and she could tune into certain things that I couldn't pick up. And it would drive me absolutely bonkers because I would be thinking, what is wrong with you? Just back, back off. You know, whoa. Pull on the chain a little bit. Well, you guys have to have it black and white. We do. Sometimes we get intuitively. Right. And um, if the black and white doesn't show up, you know, then y'all don't actually so weigh it in. Here's a wonderful, wonderful lesson. A wonderful lesson. And this is you're very true. So what happens, because the woman has an intuitive something, whatever, that spooky thing that you guys have, right? And, and you get it, you understand, and as the male, we, quite, we don't see the logic because they're, they're, the intuitive part of that is missing in the logic. So we can go A, B, C, D, one, two, three, but in the mix that is the intuitive part. We're missing that. But the problem is, is most of the time, the woman wants her husband to react emotionally. Right. Make an emotional decision. Do something now, fix it now, do this, do that, right? And what ends up happening, the man gets frustrated and either an argument ensues or he goes out and does exactly what you tell him and make a mess of the whole thing. And when he comes back and make a mess, then your spouse will blame, the woman will say, you made a mess of it because you're a man. If I would have handled it, it wouldn't have been handled that way. Right? Mm -hmm. and talk to me. Do you know that this is true? Absolutely. Or he comes in and says, you told me to do this and it was a mess. Well, that's, it may have been. Could be. Happy. Could be. So well, the whole point, the way I wanted to. right? That's all the woman but that, says. yeah, the, the woman says you just didn't do it the way I, I, I told you to do it, or I would want you to do it. So where, where you get healthy in your relationship is this: is to say, look, I, you might have a point. I'm going to take time and process this, and I'm going to go through it, and I'm going to make a decision, and we'll do something about it. And then if you insist, or my wife would insist, no, you need to do something about this now. Then I go, take care of it. Put the responsibility on her to make a mess of it. Now, if you don't trust me, that's the whole point. If you don't have trust in a marital relationship to where you say, I'm presenting this to you, I, my husband, you're, you are going through a logical process and you're not seeing this and I'm showing it to you, then give him the time to process it. And at the same time, husbands, your wife's not Mashugna. She, she's not crazy. Well, most of the time. She's not just picking. She's not crazy. You guys are crazy. You're amazing. Hashem's given you a wonderful gift. I, I wish we had it. But if we did, we wouldn't have to be, have a wife, would we? Anyway. We Betty? might be happier. <laughs> yeah. control of all the mitzvahs. What I was going to say is that, you know, God's name has the male and female aspects right. of it. And so when we have a balance like that, we join them together. Right. Absolutely. And that's, that's a balance. 
And that's beautiful. It is. We become like a big, huge battery. Exactly. Positive and negative flowing all the time. And, and the thing is, is that positive and negative, the, the way that works in a relationship, some are positive and some are negative. Sometimes you're positive and the other one's negative. And it's always, it's always going to be the opposite. How long were you married before you realized you're completely opposite from your spouse? Didn't take many of us long to figure it out. Is. Huh? Immediately, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's funny, when I hear a young couple, when I hear a young couple, and all of us are a little bit older here, but when I hear a young couple say, oh, we just have so much in common. We do everything just alike. Wait. Yeah, and I want to go, all right, hang in there, baby. <laughs> You'll wake up one morning and realize that's not the case, right? <laughs> and it's the blessing from God when you really listen to me. To me, a marriage in which your spouse is just like you is a disaster waiting to happen because you're both going to make a mess of your life. And we know that. We see people that end up following through these tricks of life of absolute destruction because they're too much like themselves. And Brooke Hashem, I have a wife that is my balance. She is a beautiful balance in my life. I mean, look, we still get on each other's nerves. We don't, you know, she doesn't levitate. I don't float around the house, right? Uh, my wife is always up in the air harping about something, so I guess it makes her an angel. But anyway, she... lost all your... Yeah, I know, I know. But the whole point is, is my wife says things to me, and it is, I now am at the place where I, I deeply appreciate them. It still makes me upset, right? Plus, I guess they're hurrah. Of you know, course. That we have to deal with. That's this. my inclination. My ego gets busted. Yeah, but we also way. learn a lot from each other. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. We learn so much from each other. Absolutely. We learn a lot about, each, about ourselves. So we're, so we're watching um, Fox News the other morning, and they said that the five or six things that men need to hear from their women, from their wives or girlfriends, or especially wives. And my wife and I are watching it, and I'm like, this is ridiculous. I mean, First of all, I would be asking you what's wrong with you if you started going, you're the most special man in the world. <laughs> right? If she said that to me, I'm like, okay, did you like bring another dog to the house and I don't know what happened here? Right? Or say something like, you're so strong and capable, you can do anything. And I'm like, I would be insulted. I would feel like a two-year-old, right? But... Is that what men in this age, young men, are needing in a relationship? Yes. Oh, my goodness. If that is the case, do you realize what's feeding our generation? Absolutely. Ego. Yep. Narcissism. Narcissism. I always have to have somebody feed my ego. Like, come on, grow up. Anyway, I had to go on my rant. Let's go on. Here we go. Uh, let's say, where are we at? Uh, any vow we're in 14, right? Or no? 17. Okay, go ahead. You want to read for me? Val? These are the decrees that Hashem commanded Moses between a man and his wife, between a father and his daughter in her youth, in her father's house. Okay, stop right there. We're not going to go into the second part because I want to save it for, um, for Wednesday's class. This is um, the big battle. And, but let, let, me, let me lead us into that with our closing. Um, This last few parshas have redemptive qualities in them that points to the time of the end of age in which Israel will have to uh, go through difficult times to enter into the land. And the one issue was dealing with those in the nations that want to curse you and obliterate you. That's Balaam and Balak, right? And then you have the sin that took place with the, the Moabite women, which is dealing with, uh, dealing with humanistic logic and debasing Torah so that you can carry about your sinful nature. And then seeing vengeance and justice coming up. It's about also that others can curse you, others cannot curse you, the nations can't curse Israel, but Israel, or the Jewish people, can curse themselves. How? By taking upon themselves idolatry and taking upon themselves uh, uh, things that are forbidden for them to do. The next layer that brings them up to a higher level is understanding that, yes, it's, it's, um, it's a positive thing in which you would want to do more, but just do it. 
Don't make a vow that creates more sin in your life. Be a person who's walking with holiness before Hashem and avoiding the sinful things in your life, avoiding sin in your life by not creating more sin in your life. And then the last is this whole idea of the children of Israel avenging uh, the thing that has happened between the Midianites and the people of Israel. It's going to be an interesting battle that takes place. And ultimately, we understand that before, what we're going to examine next, next week is what does the Midianite people represent? How does that translate in the 21st century? What does that represent for the Jewish people and the, and the nations? What does that mean when it says that before the end of age, we have to fight sort of this final battle to bring about uh, the ability to enter into the land? We'll talk about that in, in, in next week's class. So this concludes the lesson for tonight. Uh, we're going to go into our question and answer period. Everyone say shalom. Shalom. shalom.